Welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. The crossroads where culture, lifestyle, and community meet. All hosted by the legendary New York radio TV personality and proud Harlem American, G. Keith Alexander. And a very pleasant good afternoon or evening or morning, whenever you're listening. Welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Wherever you are, I appreciate you for joining our neighborhood as we hang out together in Harlem, America. Today in the What's Hot Spotlight is actor, producer, and public speaker, Miguel A. Nunez Jr. Miguel got catapulted into fame by playing Jamal Jeffries in the comedy farce, Joanna Man. He's currently starring on BET Plus in Carl Weber's The Family Business, so it is, in my, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to say that my special guest, Miguel A. Nunez Jr., is what's hot. Welcome. What's happening, man? I'm okay. What's okay. happening? <laughs> what's happening in Harlem? You know, oh. my, mom lives, my mom lives on 440 East 105th Street in East River Drive. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so you're a frequent visitor to, uh, to Harlem. Yes. Well, mom, I was born in New York, raised in North Carolina. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, well, but they really fixed Harlem up the last time I was there, man. Harlem they put some been... money over there. Harlem... But did, the, did, did, did they move the black folks out? No, no, no. We're still here. <laughs> okay, good. And, and that's I heard what, they moved the black folks out. No, no, we're still here, and that's what Harlem America is all about: trying to uh, showcase and and uh, you know let folks know that we're still here and that we want to preserve our rich history and culture. And so that's part of what Harlem America is all about. Awesome. Uh, so you know, uh, the the last time we saw each other, you were in a play at the Beacon Theater. Uh, what, what was the name of that play? I can't tell you. I've done so many. I, I've been at the Beacon Theater about 50 times, so I can't <laughs> even tell you. I know Richard Roundtree was in it, but I can't remember the name of it, though. Right, 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 right. Well, hey, let, let's, uh, let, let me ask you this. Uh, what have you learned during the pandemic about yourself? I've learned that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, a lot of time I have wasted because since I've been on pandemic, a friend of mine, he's a producer, his name is Stan Foster. He's a wonderful, amazing writer, amazing producer. And he, I was in, he was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting here chilling, watching this. And I'm saying, he said, man, listen to me. You need to go back to all your old stuff and go through it and start reviving, getting out to these companies because now nothing is in production. They're looking for stuff. And you know, I said, you know what? And I did it. And in less than two weeks, I sold a project that I spent years trying to sell. <laughs> so what I've learned in lockdown is when you are and when you are idle, nothing happens. You have to continually, continuously pushing things. Even if you have been told no a hundred times on something, continue to go. That one time might be it. So that's the only lesson I learned. And I know a lot of people have learned a lot. I think the lockdown was good because we are so divided. We were so divided. Our families were so divided. We weren't eating together. Half the time, kids were coming home. Parents were there, left them meals. And God said, okay, you know what? Hold on. Bam. And everybody started eating together. You saw people posting videos of them and their kids. And that was probably been years since they have done that. So I think it kind of brought Americans more together, hopefully. Well, I concur with you. There, there were some good things during the lockdown. Uh, and there were certainly a lot of bad people, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of bad things, people suffered and uh, you yes. know, lost, but then there were some people who, who gained a lot and, and not necessarily financially, but uh, except for the billionaires, of course, but, but gained a lot as far as going uh, uh, inward and finding out a little bit more about yourself, discovering your family again, uh, deciding on how you, you may not want to go back to the same job you had before because now you've realized well wait a minute i can do this instead so that that's great well now i always want to go and take the wayback machine let's take the wayback machine and tell me what was it like for miguel growing up uh, oh lord <clears throat> well i'm gonna give you this story <clears throat> 
I was born in New York. My mom ran away from New York, ran away from North Carolina, the same house that I grew up in, and grandmother and grandfather, her mother, father. My grandmother ran away from 17, went to New York, alone, just like I did. And my mom ended up having seven children, one after each other, one after each other, and taking us and giving us back to our grandmother because they had a farm and they needed boys. She had daughters and my mom had boys. So we were, ended up giving them to our mother in North Carolina. My mother went on to date James Brown and he dropped her off. She would pick up a um, uh, Smoker Robinson. He dropped her off. She would pick up by the eyes of brother guy. He would drop off. Then she would pick up by James Brown. My mother was 17 years old, the most gorgeous, beautiful woman in the world living in New York by herself. My mother started dating James Brown. My mother is the writer of It's a Man's World. The biggest really? song James Brown ever. My mother wrote that song and that's her claim to fame. Mm -hmm. uh, she lives off that today. Um, and then uh, we were given to our mother in North Carolina where I would pick cucumbers. I had to work in the fields in the morning all day long, pick cucumbers, butter beans, crop tobacco, suck of tobacco, stick tobacco, hung tobacco, crop tobacco, worked in a tobacco factory from the time it came in and went one end of the factory at the other end, it was going out on trains and cigarettes. Every day of my life, I said, I'm going to be a movie star. I didn't know where it came from. I don't know where it had happened. Every day I said, I'm going to be a movie star. I'm going to run away to Hollywood and I'm going to be in the movies and the TV. Every single day. When I went to the first grade, I had a jean jacket. I took a big black magic marker and I wrote Hollywood on the back of My nickname from the first grade through the time I graduated was Hollywood. Because that's all I told everybody. They'd be, oh, here come, here come Nunez. That's what they call him. Here come Nunez. Here come Nunez. Here you go Hollywood. They're going to talk about that. Hey, man, I'm, I'm going to run away. Listen to me. As soon as I graduate, I'm going to move to Hollywood. I'm going to be a movie star. I, I said it every day of my life. My uncle, who was a Cadillac dealer, came home with a license plate that had California on it. Mm -hmm. I was about nine or 11, and they said, and I sat on the sidewalk and I was just touching the license plate the whole time going, this car was in California. It's where I'm going to live. It's what it's. And they said they had to make me go in the house. When I finished eating, I ran back outside until he left. I knew it beyond a shadow of a doubt in my soul, in my heart. I knew it. So after I graduated June, July, August, September, October, I got my first check from working at a warehouse. And I just, out of the clear blue sky, just, which was God, I know, I go, I got enough money to run away today. Now, I graduated from school. I was 4'11 and weighed 75 pounds. I probably looked nine. Mm -hmm. And I ended up just making three bologna sandwiches. I did not know. I was the most naive person. I thought that was good enough to get me to California. I went downtown, wrote a, wrote a note, packed a little suitcase, and I ran away from home. And I got on the bus and I said, can I get a ticket to Hollywood? He said, no. I thought that white man, I couldn't go. I thought you had to be an actor to get into Hollywood. Really? But what he was telling me, which I found out later was, I was at the Trailway Station. Trailways goes to downtown LA on Skid Row, the worst place you could ever live in America at that time. Greyhound went to Hollywood. I didn't know that. But so when he said no, I spent so much time on Skid Row because I, I thought you had to be an actor to get into Hollywood. <laughs> So, so now I get on the bus. It takes five days to get there. I land. I only got $2 left when I get there. I didn't know where, what, who, anything. Mentally, I was probably 12 or 13 because I was raising a family. Yes, sir, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. That's it. No cursing, no smoking, no drinking. My grandfather was a preacher. My grandmother, we went to church every day, uh, cleaning up the church every night, all of that. I didn't know anything. I was so naive, a gay guy turned me down. Which <laughs> 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 one, one time I was walking around on the street and I was like, I'm going to be a movie star. And this guy was like, hey, little man, what you doing out here? And I said, I'm going to be a movie star. And I said, why are you on the street this late? I said, I'm going to have a stay. He said, come on, you can go live with me. I was like, I can live with you? And he was like, yeah, come on. I was like, so happy. And I'm walking. And I remember, and I'm like this. I'm going to be a movie star for Wilson. I was just going. He said, stop, 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 stop. Listen to me, you can't stay with me. And I was so hurt because I thought I talked too much because they always told me I talked too much growing up. I said, I'll stop talking. He was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm gay. I said, I'm happy too. I had never heard, I had never heard the word gay. We call them punks in North Carolina. I had never heard that. So then he said, no, 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 no. I like men. And I was like, oh, he was like, dude. And he ended up giving me advice. You need to do this. You need to get off the street, da, 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 and sent me on and gave me $10. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. So wait, I get on the bus. It takes five days to get there. I get here, I land, I got $2. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. I didn't, I didn't know. 
I wasn't going to call home from a big family. I was embarrassed. I just didn't know what to do. The guy ended up kicking me out of there. I ended up taking, walking down the street and I didn't go too far from the bus station. It was like a cat. You, you know, mama get away. But I took 10 steps in either direction. I was lost. I see a movie theater that says $1 all night. So at least I'll be inside. Mm-hmm. So I get in I get inside now. I got my feet up in line because these big rats running around. I got my feet up. And I got this little box razor that everybody carry in North Carolina. And I look down toward the front. There's a guy, you can see his head there. And every time it seemed like I woke up, the head was closer and closer to the last time I woke up with some big, nasty homeless guy. I popped my razor out. He jumped up and ran. And I walked that. But that was God's way of telling me to watch out early. So I just walked around in the streets and walked around the streets. So I started sleeping in the, in the, in, in the daytime because in the, in, in, I didn't have nowhere to sleep. Uh, so, I mean, sleeping at night and just instead of walking around at night, sleeping at night and being up in the day, I didn't know where to eat. I didn't know what to do. I started selling my blood. I started to uh, go to the height, read and see wish well and steal money out of the wish well to eat. I didn't know what to do. So I uh, ended up, uh, I'm going to skip because I could take too long to go piece by piece. So anyway, after that, I uh, ended up going to the Union Rescue Mission here downtown Los Angeles, which is a, it was a little one room shack in the middle of Skid Row for the bums to get into at night when it was cold, because it was October now. Mm-hmm. So I ended up going there. I was the youngest one, they called me young, young blood. And um, I ended up getting on welfare. I got a job at Rancho Las Amigas Hospital in Downey, California, under the CEDA program, the welfare program. They gave me a hotel where you just sign your name and a voucher. You can eat three meals a day at this restaurant. You just sign your name. because I don't get called uh, welfare here. And I got on that. So I just wrote a letter home to my family. I got an apartment and a job. I was lying. And I was like, <laughs> I was happy. I end up, this is like after a few months, I end up getting a letter from home. I opened up, all it said was, call home food. That's all it said. <laughs> call home food. Food, yes. <laughs> so, so I ended up calling home. And anyway, I told him I had an apartment. I wasn't going to give it a shot. I ended up staying on welfare. I got my first check, saved up all my money, and, and saved up, kept saving my money. Because once you get your first check, you, not, you can't pay, that you can't sign the voucher. But the hotel was only $60 a month. So I paid up my rent. Anyway, no, it's actually, I saved up my money and I had met some other guys, Carlos, KK, uh, Sam, and Gary. I always been, they were doing the same thing. They had been there for months. Man, you're going to get two and seven. I'm like, dude, we can get out of this. I'm going to be a movie star. And they told me the same thing. And this is important for everybody listening, young people. They told me every same thing that every single person told me in my entire life. Everybody in North Carolina. You're skinny, you're black, you're poor, and you're ugly. There is no way on God's earth that you're, you're going to become a successful actor. How is it you're going to become a successful actor? There are actors in, in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, LA, Philadelphia. There are actors in, in the union. They actually got lawyers, managers. There's no way. When I got here, they were saying the same thing. You're skinny, you're black, you're ugly, you're on skid row. I said, I guarantee you it's going to happen. Nothing. Listen to me. Anybody out there. Don't let anybody tell you what you can or cannot do. Don't let anybody try to convince you that you can't do something. Listen to me. I had nothing. Every step I took in every direction was lost. But this is the difference between knowing, believing in yourself. If you know, and this is the only thing, I I didn't know this. I got this from my own life's lesson. If you know and you truly believe, and I swear to you, uh, I really, really, really did it, Greg. I knew it. I knew it from when I said in North Carolina as a kid, I knew it. It wasn't something I hope. Yeah, I hope I'm going to be one. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to be one. I knew it. And that's the thing that keeps you there. That's the thing that makes you keep going. When somebody doesn't have that true belief in themselves, that's what make them go back home. That's what make them start shooting stuff in their arm downtown, which I could have ended then because they lose hope. They don't see no way. I didn't see a way. But I knew it would happen, so I knew there was a way. So you have to have that true, undeniable belief in whatever it is you set out to do. I guarantee you nothing can stop you. All right, so now I end up, uh, uh, I get uh, the job, and I move to Hollywood. So now when I get to Hollywood, now I know you can go to Hollywood now because I've been on the bus now. Right. And, um, <laughs> but I, I didn't go through all the things that happened with the, eating the trash out there, uh, ending up in, in jail one night because I jumped in a car with the wrong people. They robbed somebody. The next day I know I got a cop with a shotgun at my head and I'm laying on the ground. This is maybe after uh, three weeks of being on the street and all I'm thinking about is my grandmother was right. One day you're going to end up in jail. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, that's, that's so many things in this that will absolutely blow your mind, but I'm just skipping ahead. So anyway, so now uh, I start working at Rancho Las Amigas Hospital. I invite Gary, Kike, Sam, Carlos, 
and, and to come and live with me in Hollywood. So now we all paid the rent. So now my rent was cheap. So now I get the yellow page. I start looking up all the studios and I started sneaking in, getting kicked out, sneaking in, getting kicked out. And another problem, don't let nobody, don't let nothing stop you. Don't let a no stop you. I'll give you an example. I told my friend, I talked like this when I first got here. So they used to call me country boy. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I told my friend, I want to go to Universal Studio, to the Universal Studio. I want to walk inside and I want to walk around on the stages and I want to see how they do it. He said, man, they ain't going to let you do that. I'm trying to figure, what do you mean they ain't going to let me? So I go there anyway. And I walk up to them with my little skinny dirty self and I, I said, hey, listen, my name is Miguel Nunez. I'm from 640 Cemetery Street and I came here to Hollywood. I want to be an actor. All I want to do is just walk around and I'm not going to be in anybody's way. I just want to look so I can learn how to do it. He said, man, get your little skinny ass out of here. You can't. <laughs> You can't do that. So I was like, he said, I, I, they won't let me. And he said, I can't. So I did. That was a concept. When you know, those are con- when you don't know, and when you don't believe that door shut, you go, oh, God. And you just say, wow, I can't do it. No, I was like, I know it's meant to be. I know it. So there's got to be a way. So I ended up selling my blood plasma for two or three weeks. Then I ended up taking the Universal Studio tour. <clears throat> There's a part at the Universal Studio Tour where they say, everybody get off the tram, and I want everybody to line up over here. The tram is going to pick us up on the other side. We're going to go inside, and we're going to see how they do TV shows. It's Uh not real, but it's going to be a simulation. Mm -hmm. That's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so so they go, okay, all right, all right. So everybody, come. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. And while they were coming this way, coming this way, I was going that way, going that way, going that way. (laughs) And I walked around to every stage and they were shooting real shows. I went up in the top, I wasn't loud. I wasn't trying to ask people questions. And I went to three different stages and I was there to the end. I knew what time the last tram left. So I went around the other side and got on that and finished. I did exactly what he said they, I, they wasn't gonna let me do. And exactly what that guy said I couldn't do. Miguel, wow, what One a minute break. We got to take a break in, in uh, uh, right We'll now. pick it up right there. We'll pick it up when we come back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're with Miguel A. Nunez Jr. from the family business. And you might remind, remember him from Joanna Man. He's got some stories for us. And we'll be right back after this break. Thank you, Kevin. Boy, I'm having a great time listening to <laughs> Miguel Nunez. I'm telling you, Miguel, you have uh, got stories upon stories. And uh, now we, we left off where you're just getting ready to tell me about. Uh, well, you tell me what you hold doing. on, because I forgot to. You forgot to. <laughs> oh, well, all right. Tell, tell, what tell, was it? tell me about how you used to wake up. Oh, at the mission? Yeah. Listen, was... Let me explain to you about the mission. See, I'm skipping ahead, but there's so many things in here that that uh, um, that I went through. For instance, the United Union Rescue Mission. On the skid row, it was just a little hole in the wall church with one row with about 20 pews. You had to get there before seven o'clock. And all they did was let the people come in and fill up the pews. I was the youngest one there and you sit there like this in the pew and you wake up in the morning, there's bum on here and it's funky and it's rum. I woke up covered in lice every single morning. Wow. And you had to, and remember, I put my suitcase when I got there in the, in the suitcase at the bus station where you put quarter, 50 cents or quarter, and you yeah. turn that little key and you take it. But you can't go there two and three weeks later and you, you don't get the story. So when you go there, they said, no, you have to pay like seven, $8 to get your thing because it's been in there. Da-da. I didn't have any money. So I had to wear the same clothes over and over. So you go downstairs in the mission and they take your clothes to wash them and then they spray you with poison now. The guy inside, that you walk in this little room, he's got a hazmat suit on and one of those <laughs> silver cans that you pump it and spray, and you walk in a nigga, he just goes. <laughs> now, now, not that's not to say, I don't know if he had the hazmat suit on because of the lice or if he had the hazmat suit on because of the poison, but right. we didn't have nothing. They shot it right on us. They washed your clothes. Send you in this room that is hell on earth with seven, eight bums and, and feces and everywhere. You just find one little place to wash your stuff off and you wait for your clothes. But the reason I say that is that's the kind of stuff that makes people give up on their dreams. 
when people find out it's so hard, it's so tough, I, I, I can't go through this. I got a mom and a dad and I, I, mean, I, I could have went right back home and my grandmother would have been cooking every day. I, we had food out, out, out right out. We had the biggest food of potatoes, everything we wanted to eat right from the, from the field where our meat came from. We had cows, pigs, right from the bar, every single thing, corn, everything. That, Biggest meal you ever seen straight from the garden. You didn't even need a butter on the potatoes. They were so good. I could have went back home to that. I could have went back home to no rent, stayed at home. That's the, when you really truly know that's what makes you endure. What I went through with making a normal person who didn't truly have the confidence and belief in themselves, that would make them go home. That's what make girls come out to, to be uh, models and actresses to end up on a pole. That's what make people shoot up. That's what make people turn around and go back. You have to 100% commit to whatever that decision is in your life. God gives everybody a special talent. And there's some time in your life, just like me, I knew I want to be that. And I didn't let it go and give up. I didn't let people say, you can't do that. You in North Carolina, you need to come. And everybody told me, and I don't blame them because they were right. They were right that it was a hard climb. They were right there are thousands of actors ahead of me. They were right it's the hardest business on the entire planet. They were right that how, how are you going to get your acting classes? How are you going to get everything they said was true? You are smart. I was an A-B student. You could get a job here as an executive. You can make money. You can make a big, everything they said, but it was not what I wanted. If you don't have that kind of belief in yourself, don't go leave and, leave and try to follow your dream because if it gets hard, you won't be able to make it. So, so let me keep going. So when did you, wait, wait. So let me, when did, you get your, when did you get your first acting break? How did that happen now? All right, good. Let me just get there, perfect. Um. <coughs> I never eat these for breakfast. <laughs> m ms <laughs> Get stuck um, listen, yeah. I eat breakfast every morning. Um, I'm on a bus, and there's a guy next to me, and he's going. And I'm like, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to get ready to go on a cattle call. I said, what's that? He said, I'm auditioning for a, a commercial. I said, hey, my name is Gail Nunez. I'm with 647 Third Street, West Carolina. I came in to be an actor. I said, what is that? He said, oh, this is a resume. I said, can I see it? He said, yeah, yeah, take it. You're going to have to get a resume. And you're going to have to get some pictures and blah, 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 blah. I see him get off the bus. And I look over and I see all these cameras in the park. <gasps> and I get off. So I get off on the next stop. <laughs> I take his, his resume. I go into a copy place. I write his name. I put my name on it. And I go back. <laughs> I didn't know you didn't need a resume for a calico. And yeah. I went back to that part and I got the lead in a Gino's restaurant commercial. Really? I got the lead then because it was just what I do. <laughs> and to this day, and that was 1980. And to this day, I remember every single line. It was like a, a little basketball team, a little skinny me walking in front going, um, like birds of a feather, we stick together. So when we eat out, we all agree. We go to Geno's and they go unanimously. And then he had me bust it in. We go for, G I go for Geno's Surla and one thick, juicy quarter pound of 100% of pure beef that's unreal. And, they were, and I got the lead. So then wow. I just told the guy, I was like, they said, how did you find out about that? Because anybody can come on a cattle call. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said, that guy right there. And they got, you got it? And I told him, da, 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 da. and he said, you don't have an agent. He said, I'll take you to my agent. So he took me to his agent. And his agent, I'm like, listen, you can have all the money for that. I want to be in the movies. I don't, I don't want to do the commercial. I want to be in the movies. I didn't know it was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I want to be in commercials and, and, and TV shows. And he said, you know, I like you. I'm going to sign you up. Of course you could, so you can get 10%. Right. And he signed me up. And I think the next 47 auditions he sent me on major television, major movies, I probably got 42 of them. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what determination and, and what 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 blessings, what luck, what what uh, all yeah. of it. Three three years later, I was on tour of duty on CBS, a hit show for three years. Started out making ten thousand five hundred dollars a week. The next season, I was making seventeen thousand five hundred dollars a week, and then the last season, twenty seven thousand five hundred dollars a week. I was living in Hawaii the first year, making ten thousand five hundred dollars a week. I never had a bank account. Every time I cashed it, it was 22 episodes. So uh -huh. I got 10,522 times. The first check I cashed it, I put it in my pocket, spent every dime. I did that every <laughs> single check till about, and then the next season, 17,525 times, I didn't buy anything because I don't have it. I got a real hour ahead there. 
I, I, I got it out of my system. I ended up saving some of my, then I started buying homes, flipping homes, ended up selling a Fonzo Rivera. I was on the Fresh Prince, sold him his house. And, and I started doing that. Wow. So, yeah. wow. I put God first. And let me tell you how I know it was God. There's never a time in that house where there's eight boys of us and my aunt had five kids, five daughters. So that's like 12, 13 of us in the house. There's never a point where there's no one home. When I went home to, to leave, there was no one there. And I got here in October, November, December. I had me, Keith K, Gary, uh, uh, Sam, and Carlos. And we were mm-hmm. walking downtown. It's Christmas Eve. I'm with the, right in front of the bus station downtown, which is crowded place with, with, with people, the, the, the worst bus station. We're walking down the street. They're a little bit in front of me. And I can see them talking and walking like this. And I walk behind them because I'm, I'm, I look the youngest. And I'm about to cry because it was the Christmas time. And that was the time we didn't get beaten in home. It was the best time ever in, 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 for, <laughs> to be home. You didn't get no beatings. You got candy, and apples, and orange, all this stuff. <laughs> and I said these verbatim. I said, dear God, and I prayed every day. That was the closest I ever got to God because when I was on the street, you see people walking around talking like this. I was doing it. I wake up in the morning, God, it's like he was there. Every minute, I was talking to him. You know, I might look like a homeless, crazy person, but I literally, the closest I ever been with God was there. I felt him there every day. He was who I had, and I literally talked to him like he was there. I'm hungry, and something, something, something would happen. It's Christmas Eve. Now I'm walking behind him, and I say these words verbatim. Dear God, please, 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 God, you can't let it be like this. As soon as I open my eyes, I look down. They all for them walking. There's no way on God's earth they missed it. There's $180 bought up in 20s on the sidewalk. <laughs> and in the whole 17 years of growing up in North Carolina, that house, that's probably why every Christmas toy we had for 17 years cost $180. <laughs> um, and so I took everybody to the movies. We went to the movies, got everybody something to eat. And now I'm walking in front. If you see, I ate a Murphy, everybody mock how I walk. I got like mm-hmm. a little print. And I was all walking in front of happy. And I go, hey, hey, look. At two o'clock in the morning, we saw some Richard Fry movie. Completely empty street there on downtown LA. It's on Broadway. So all the Spanish people shot. And there was a counter where you could point to and they put it out. Tell me this is not God. Two o'clock in the morning, I walk by and there's a huge gift. Huge, probably about this big. Mm-hmm. Right? All white, white bowl, and nobody there. And I grab, I say, hey, look, somebody left a present. And this white couple passed by. I said, oh, well, it's yours now. So I got $180 and a big gift. <laughs> Tell me that's not God. That's God. It had to be. It that's had good. to be. Wow. And there's a, there's a few more incidents that happened just like that, where it, the most unbelievable uh, blessing came at the most unbelievable time in my life because I always, always kept him first. I always prayed. And that was my grandparents. They say, bring a child up in the Lord. And they went up. That helped me a lot. Fantastic. Well, okay. So let's, let's go. Uh, uh, Go fast forward. Well, you asked. Yeah, I know. I know. And it's all interesting. You said it's all interesting. I'm telling you. Uh, how did you get Joanna Man? Well, honestly, to be t- honestly and truthful, and he doesn't even know this, I, I can contribute getting Joanna Man to Will Smith. And I'm the sorry. reason I say that, and I just said, I just started seeing this because Will Smith is a good friend of mine. He always said to me, Yo, you got to start playing golf. You got to start playing golf. All the big deals happen on the golf course. You got to start playing golf. And I never did. One day I thought about it. You know what? Maybe Will was right. Shoot, I need a job. So I went. I said, I'm going to go to Witsit, which is a very prestigious a golf course right here in Studio City, like two minutes from my house. Mm-hmm. I go over there. I get this black guy who everybody in the world gets, who, whose sons are eight and nine, sitting out hitting the ball like Tiger Wood. And they tell me to go to him. So I get him. I'm training. He's teaching do this. Keep your hand in there. Less than 15 minutes there. On a golf course for the first time after Will Smith telling me 20 years, some guy goes, I'm sorry, yeah. He's, hey, um, I'm gonna direct them doing this movie. Uh, it's called um, Joanna Man. And I love you on the show, Sparks, Sparks, and Sparks. You're really, really good. I think you should come in for a screen test. And that's how I ended up getting Joanna Man. Really? And come to find and come find, find out. I'm like, I won, I won 98% of every job then. So I, I was wondering why I didn't get, how did I not hear about this? And I was told that the casting director style wasn't right. 
<laughs> really? The casting director told you that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Look, okay. But uh, what, what was it like when you found out you had to wear a dress? When you had to? Hey, wear... listen. I knew the story all along. I didn't care about that. I thought it was the opportunity to go out there and be the lead in a movie and kill it. That's all I thought about. I didn't think about no dress. I was thinking about Tootsie did it, and he was great in Tootsie. And the New York Times said Miguel Nunez was better as your Wonder Man than Dustin Hoffman was in Tootsie. Really? And that's what, yeah, that's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about Tootsie, and I was like, oh, wow, I can do a black Tootsie, but make it funny? That's all I was thinking about. The hardest part of that was the voice. I spent months trying to figure out how to do a voice that didn't sound, you know what I'm saying? How do, how do I do a voice? I didn't know. I was like, oh, my name is Juana. I was like doing this. And I was like, that was the only thing that worried me. I was doing it, doing it. And then I just got to the point, I just gave up. I said, whatever one comes out when I do the first take, I'm going to try to stick with that. So I didn't know how I was going to do it. So I get to Charlotte. We shot in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm in the trailer. We get there maybe three hours before any of the crew, they got the light on just for my makeup because it's a long process. And they had one little AD girl and she walks in and goes, after all this worrying for months, sitting there right now sweating what's going to come out first time. She walks in and said, uh, excuse me, would you like some sweet tea? That's it! That's the voice! All I got to do is do it like that, Pat Country, you'll never know! Oh my God! And that's when I came up with the voice and making her country. I even changed the line in there to add that line. And that, I don't know if that girl ever know, knew this or know this. She was where I got the voice on. When she came in and said, well, would you like some sweet tea? That's it. It doesn't matter what you say. I like if you do it with a, with a country voice. So it was perfect. All that, And that was, again, God. All that worrying for me, just ask me and I'll give it to you. If I had a not worried about it, say, you know what, God's going to give it to me. That would have happened and I would have done Thank you, God. That's why we worry instead of taking it to God. We worry about it. Taking it to God, you don't have to worry. Don't have to worry. Well, how, how did Joanna Man change your life? Oh, God. Joanna Man changed my life. You know what? Honestly, I, I really don't. I, it hasn't changed my life in any way. In the business, it killed it. Because it didn't get, res it didn't get the respect that it should have from the industry. I mean, I, I mean, I haven't gotten big jobs because of Juana Man, which it should have been the opposite. Mm -hmm. With the public, the, the industry, the Warner Brothers have no clue. Lionsgate have no, these studios have no clue. That movie is huge. A part two would blow sky high. And no, one, they, no one's sitting there. They don't know. They have no clue. It hurt me more than it helped. That's the honest to God truth about Juana Man. It's super popular. If I go out right now, you think Joanna May came out last week. That's right. They're, they're, but the executives in this industry have not even the slightest freaking clue. When, so when, I think Joanna Man hurt me. It helped me with popularity, but mm -hmm, it hurt mm -hmm. me career-wise. When, when I told my uh, director of uh, web content, uh, Richard Lalit, that uh, I was going to have you on the show today, he says, oh, I, I love him as Joanna Man. He was, he was great, you know. Dude, I get thousands every airport storming, screaming, like he, uh, just as if the movie came out last week. And again, if one of the executives at Warner Brothers anywhere walked through to four airports with me, they would do it tomorrow. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're oblivious. <laughs> Incredible. Well, okay, so now... We're, we're winding down to about, and we've got about maybe two or three minutes before we take our next break. Uh, how did you get onto this drama series that I'm telling you, this, this I have become a big fan of the family business. How did that come about for you? I have worked with Carl Weber and Trey Haley, the director, uh, on another project, a couple of projects. Actually, as a matter of fact, two films and a pilot. And the pilot is amazing. It's called Flipping the Hood. We're mm -hmm. going to go into the hood. We're going to go into and take houses. We're going to flip these houses and fix them up. And then we're going to put people on, uh, who couldn't get a loan, who can't afford their homes. We're going to put these families into these homes. So we were shooting that. Carl would have said, you know what? I got a project I'm getting ready to do. I think you'd be great for this role of Harris. And I was like, so if I had gone through the regular process of the audition process, of audition, I wouldn't be doing this role because people think of me a drama, but they don't know I'm far better in drama. I was nominated for an image award for best drama for tour duty. I'm 100% better in drama than comedy. Carl Weber saw that. 
if they had done a regular audition process, I wouldn't be playing Harris. Carl Weber saw it before. He is a genius. He saw it, and Carl Weber can see things that he is a, a creative genius. Trey Haley, he can see things as a director that that's, their vision is amazing. And as you can see this show, amazing. It, it is an amazing show. We've got 20 seconds before we uh, go to break, but I want to remind people that uh, this voice that you hear, that uh, I can't get a word in edgewise because I'm with Miguel A. Nunez Jr. And he is an amazing individual and with great determination. And we'll listen to more of what he has to say when we come back. This is What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. G. Keith! Okay, welcome back. Uh, so, Miguel, uh, what do you have coming up? Uh, I'm just working on a family business right now. I'm also uh, working with a guy named Herb Kimball up at Urban Flicks TV to develop a new show. So I'm going to be looking over, look over at Urban Flicks TV. Uh, it's an amazing new streaming service. And um, I'm going to be doing a couple of shows over there. So uh, I'm trying to do, put together this show called X's and O's. Yeah, you know, most movie. talk most talk shows are women. You know, shown the, the talk and the view and all that. But right. men and women see the same thing, totally different. So I want three women and three men, and it's going to be called X's and O's, and it's going to be fire. So we're working, we're getting that together right now. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. So I am developing a Joanna Man too. So sorry. Oh, you are you you are developing yes. it. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I'm gonna get it done without studio help or with or without studio help. There you go. There you go. So, what uh, in order to become the uh, person and actor that you are now, which I understand, folks don't really know the the folks who are listening to this show really don't know that you are really Hollywood royalty. I've been told that. What, what know, does that mean? Well, you know that, that, that you're a big deal out there in Hollywood. I I, I looked up your uh, IMDB and uh, uh, you know, I'm a SAG member also, but I, I've only got four credits. You've got 138 credits, film credits. Jeez, Damn, there more than any black person in the business. Incredible. <laughs> and the credit, and ain't, ain't, BAT ain't called, TV1 ain't said nothing. Nobody's noticed it, which is, uh, which is kind of good and kind of bad. It's amazing. One more auditions, one, been to the network more time, more network TV series, more films, and no recognition whatsoever. Well, but I, I got it recognized in the right places, though. That's the most important. That's the well, most. I don't care about it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, well, well that's, right. only, that's only a temporary condition because you are uh, getting ready to, to realize your ultimate dream. The God's universe is conspiring in your favor, and the best is yet to come. I truly, I received that 100%, and I believe it, and I know it. I know it. No Damn. doubt about it. What? So, so tell me about your, uh, you, you, you had a relationship with uh, the, the great late now, Paul Mooney. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. No, I just, I just know Paul. Uh, Paul was, Paul kept it real, 100%. Paul always kept it real. Paul was a genius, a, a comedic genius. He wrote for a lot of the greats. And the reason Paul didn't skyrocket the way Paul should have or could have is because Paul kept it real. Paul didn't play the Hollywood game. If he would have just played the game, Paul Mooney would have been way bigger. More TV shows, more movies, but Paul Mooney didn't play the Hollywood game. He kept it real 24-7. He was a really, really, really good guy. All I know about Paul is every time he was around, he was joking, laughing, and made you laugh. And, and I never really saw him really take things too serious because when he laughed about it, when he made a joke about it, he would do a little a smirk. So mm -hmm. I think I think Paul Boney was um, probably one of uh, our comedic, writing comedic geniuses. And, and he, was a, he was a really good guy. That's all I know about him. I don't know much about his private life. All I know about is what he was when he was around me. And that's all I can speak to. Interesting. So now let's talk about working on the, uh, the set. Uh, 
SAG had some protocols that they implemented during the time that you guys uh, were uh, shooting the family business. And I, and I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't seen the family business yet, you must go and binge on it. Started season one at the beginning. And I'm telling you, I was angry when season two was over about four or five weeks ago. And uh, I, I, I mentioned it to uh, Darren and Darren said, hey, uh, that's okay. We're, we're, we're coming back. We're, we're coming back. So uh, folks, you've got to see the, the family business where uh, Miguel plays Harris and Harris is sort of, he, he, he's an attorney and he, he's the, the fixer uh, for the uh, family. family. Yeah, for the family. And uh, I'll, let, I'll let Miguel tell you a little bit about the character and about the show. So you can really uh, be encouraged to, to check it out. Yeah, you need to check it out. Family business is empire on steroids. That's what it is. It's empire on steroids. We're a gangster family. We're successful. I played the family attorney. I'm married to Tammy Roman, who is, happens to be a Duncan. It's the Duncan Family Motors, international, one of the biggest international car companies in the world. We do jets, all luxury vehicles all over the world. We ship all the way. We ship one to Brunei, to the, to the whatever. But in our cars, we might have drugs, bodies, no matter what. But whatever we have to do, we do to stay on top. You don't cross the Duncan family. Harris is the fixer. I might slide a suitcase here. I might slide a suitcase here. I'm going to do whatever it is needs to do to protect the Duncan family. That's the bottom line. And that means whatever it is. If I have to take out my own father, you need to watch the show. I would wow. do what needs to be done. Wow. So, yeah. so what is it like working with um, uh, er Ernie Hudson, uh, Valerie Pettiford, and, uh, and, and, and Darren Henson? Listen, I know. It sounds like a cliche when they say, oh, you mean like a family? Because you hear that, yeah, we're like a family. It is truly that. Valerie is like, like a fresh smelling rose. Mm -hmm. She's like a, a, a bloom, like the prettiest rose. If you walked into a garden and everything was there and you look, oh, look over there. And that was this big rose and everything else was brown and, and thorny. And it was a big, huge, not a regular rose, but a big one. And it was blooming and beautiful and it was like it was made. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and, and you looked over there, that's Valerie. Every time she comes around, <laughs> you can smell her. <laughs> not her, not, not any kind of cologne. You can smell her energy when she comes up. She's up, she's happy. Ernie Hudson is my brother for life. Ernie Hudson is the nicest, caringest, calmest, get along, peaceful a guy I've ever met in my life. He, Darren Henson is a professional, staunch, Great actor, always determined to do the best, always want to be on point. Everybody on this show, including the production team, are on point. It's like a well-oiled well machine. And, and, and SAG has implemented, as you mentioned, these new protocols. Mm -hmm. Because if you notice what happened in the region with Tom Cruise, somebody came on and said something, something about a mask. I totally agree. Everything he said, almost 98% and even how he did it. I think he went on just a little bit too long, but yes, you were threatening everybody's job. One person get it. Hundreds of people are out of job. They're gonna shut down production. SAG has instrumented some of the most stringent protocols, but I think in the beginning we were so annoyed. Let me give you an example. To keep everybody safe, and to keep everybody working, because you gotta remember, it's not just a hundred people working, they got kids and families, so it's thousands. So we have to get tested Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You have to get tested three times a day before you go on to the set. Then when you go on to the, no, the next day you get tested, then the next day you get your, your results from that, then you can go on the set. But you still, after getting tested three times before your work day, you still got to get the blood prick to make sure you didn't go into 7-Eleven and then pick it up on the gas station pump before you got here. Wow. And then you still got to wear masks. And then when you go to ask, I don't go to the craft service, let me grab a water. Ah, whoa, 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 you can't pick up a the water. They're going to hand you your water and they spray it in a paper bag. Oh, I need some size. Ah, ah, ah. You can't touch the script. They're going to hand you your script in a bag. They, anything delivered, they have gone above and beyond. Facts 
policy is stringent. Uh, uh, Tridestin, who's actually the production company with Carl Weber and Indy Brown and Carl Trey Haley, they have gone a little bit above and beyond that in order to make sure that everybody on our set is safe. So I think that the, and I got to tell you, we were like, hey, come on, I had the test, I got the print, come on, stop, what are y'all doing? You get annoyed and annoyed with all of these things. Now, come on, why can't I test it? You just did, I ain't got it. Yeah, but somebody, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's, you got so annoyed, but then after a while, it becomes, it starts to become part of it, and then you don't even feel it anymore. And, and that's why I'm so, feel so safe working on the show. That wow, that that that's incredible. I uh, you know, most of my auditions I've had to do uh, self auditions. Virtual, yes, yeah. yes. Self. -audition. Now, I don't think that I'm not even sure they they they've haven't they're having in in college auditions anymore yet. All, all every audition I've had on has been on uh, video. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and uh, it has uh, been uh, you know really strange, really different. I went to my agent's office just uh, the other day because I. I you know, I was downtown, uh, and let me give a shout out to CESD. Uh, and, oh, you were CESD, all yeah, right. Yeah, I was CESD. My kids were with CESD. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, I went there, and the office was closed. There was only one person in the office. And well, why'd they, you go? Because uh, I needed to go to the bathroom. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they pretty much closed now. Everybody, even the agents are remote now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Uh, you know, so th this is, you know, you are a man with uh, many stories. Uh, what, has someone offered to do your life story or do a book or something? Nope. Nope. I wrote the book. I just finished writing it and I wrote the script. Really? Yeah. Uh, so now you're going to start shopping? I'll let you read it. I'll send it to you. Please do. I'll send yes. a copy. I'm not sending it to that many people because it's so in depth and it's so personal i'm just i don't know if i should even tell it it's but it's amazing every single thing from what i was thinking from the time i was born and raised in the house to the time i got on the bus what i was thinking on the way here while i was thinking while i was going through it all this stuff i wrote it out in a book and in a script i'm not finished but i need like an editor somebody to help me but i'm still working on it well we've got about three minutes before we wind down but i want to ask you what does your family think of you now you ran away from home you become uh, uh, hero, 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 inspiration to every single body in my family that they can do everything. They know more than anybody where I came from. They know more than anybody that I had nothing. So they know what I went through. I make sure you guys follow me on Instagram at M N U N E Z J R. And if you want to get in, I'm starting to hold, I'm help. I've helped thousands of people right now. I'm starting to learn everything about crypto. So I'm, I found so many good tips and making so many people money. And if you want to get in, you got to email me at M Nunez, M N U N M N U N E Z J R one M Nunez Junior one at Gmail. Say so I want in crypto, and that is the wave of the future. We got to get black folks into this. Uh, oh, okay. Tell us real quickly because we got about a minute. What is G nine 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 G triple nine? How you know about that? G999 G999 is a new coin that's going to be announced on the 25th of uh, uh, of June, mm -hmm. June. And uh, out of Dubai. And it is a new coin that's going to come out. Right now it's less than a dollar. So I'm grabbing up as much as I can cuz after the announcement, the more people that have that coin, it's going to come out higher. So then my little investment right now is going to skyrocket. It's very very the key is to buy coin really, really low that have strong potential. So if you get into the, and you can buy Bitcoin through G99, you can buy Ethereum through G99. It's an amazing new platform that I'm working with right now. Anybody interested, email me immediately before <laughs> June the 25th. Immediately. <laughs> wow, incredible. All right, so um, the third season has started uh, and uh, we should all check out the third season and in our last yes. minute or so, the last minute or so, you, you're saying that the third season is even better than the last two seasons? Yes, 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 yes. But you got to, like you said, you got to watch all of them so you can get where the story is and see where we are. So then you really understand and feel the impact of season three and you can get an idea of what season four is going to blow your mind. Incredible. Well, hey, uh, Miguel, this has been uh, wonderful. 
energetic, uh, uh, revealing uh, interview. I don't even want to call it interviews. It's just been a great conversation because experience. Uh, yes, uh, experience. Because I asked you maybe during this whole uh, session, maybe five questions, and you took it away. <laughs> That's great. I, I I answered 100. <laughs> yes, you did. My brother, I thank you so very, very much. And, uh, you know, stay in contact. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and Anytime I'll come back to. I fantastic. Well. And, and, and we're going to follow you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so very much for uh, being a part of What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Don't forget to go to our website at harlemamerica.com and check out some of the other podcasts that we have there. And also, if you're a Black business owner, we're here to help build fame, fortune, and followers around your business. So check out harlemamerica.com and you'll find out about it. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Have a great day and a better one tomorrow. G. Keith, bye.